Next this morning, these final verses of the passage we read together, Luke 24, 50 to 53. I'll read those with you again. I led them, and he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple blessing God. This is the word of God. Beloved in Christ Jesus our Lord, saying goodbye is never an easy experience. I think I'm not the only one who would say something like that. It's been over two years since we left Langley, British Columbia, where I served as pastor for four years. And still, the memories of our farewell uh, loom large in our hearts and minds. It was during COVID, uh, so we had a half an hour long drive-by uh, farewell. Perhaps some of you saw snippets of it. It was, a, it was a difficult moment to say goodbye to so many people we loved and so many people who loved us. It's difficult even in our present age when we can connect with people again via Zoom technology or, or on WhatsApp or FaceTime or whatever it is. It's hard to imagine what it was like for, for our immigrant uh, forebearers, the ones who came to this continent and in many respects thought they were saying goodbye and perhaps did say goodbye to their families for the first time or for the last time, saying goodbye and saying, uh, we don't know if we'll see you again. Those final goodbyes must have been that much more difficult uh, for, for those immigrants as well. Well, if we think of our passage this morning, we could say it's a, it's a farewell service of sorts. It's a farewell service for Jesus, and it's with his disciples, with the church. The disciples have no idea when or if even they're going to see Jesus again on this side of his return. He's promised he's going to return someday, but he's told them that he's going away to be with his father. And it's striking if we think about the nature of goodbyes, the nature of farewells, that this is no tear-filled goodbye. There are no tears shed, at least no tears of sorrow shed in our passage uh, this morning. It's not like when, when Mary saw Jesus in the garden. You may recall that story from the Gospel of John. And she goes to him and she clings to him with all her might. She grabs him around the ankles. He doesn't want to let him go. And, and then Jesus says to her, I have to go to my father. You have to stop holding on to me. Here the disciples don't try to cling to Jesus. They're not filled with sorrow as he departs. In fact, uh, Luke tells us their emotions in verse 52. He says in verse 52, they worshiped him after he's gone and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. If we think of the emotions of the disciples in this moment as Jesus leaves them for good, you'd say this side of his return, they're filled with great joy. It's certainly not what we would imagine to be the case if we think about the experience of saying goodbye to Jesus. If we think about our own experience in this life, perhaps you've had thoughts like me where you thought it would be so much easier if Jesus had just stuck around. It would be so much easier if we could walk with Jesus and talk with Jesus, if we could be with him physically if he had just stayed. Wouldn't it be so much easier if our faith was turned to sight in this moment wouldn't it be so much simpler? Perhaps there are times in your life where you feel as though you've been abandoned by your Savior. And you think, where is he anyway in my daily struggle? Where is he when I'm dealing with this particular circumstance? Why in the world did he leave his church behind? Well, it's obviously not what the disciples are thinking in this moment. It's instructive for us this morning, it's deeply encouraging and comforting for us to consider why is it that the disciples are filled with joy and how can we be filled with joy this morning as we consider the fact that Jesus is no longer with us but has ascended into the presence of his Father. And so this morning we're going to consider the great blessing, the constant blessing that Jesus' ascension is for the church, not just for the church in that moment but for the church today as well. And the first thing we can think of, especially when we're thinking of the disciples themselves, this is a moment of confirmation for the disciples. Now, if you notice during this, the verses immediately prior, how filled with doubt the disciples were. I mean, they've seen the risen Lord with their physical eyes. He's entered into the room right in front of them, and they, they still disbelieve. And there's this process throughout our chapter of the disciples coming to increasing faith in Jesus. But then the ascension comes. And what's their response to the ascension? Well, verse 52 tells us they worshiped him. They worshiped Jesus. And you have to know that in the Gospel of Luke, this is the first time 
the disciples worship Jesus. It's the first time that the disciples worship Jesus. They know now who he is beyond the shadow of a doubt. They've seen the risen Lord. They've watched him as he ate the broiled fish. They've put their hands in his side. They've touched the nail marks in his hands. And now as they see him ascending into heaven, they know finally beyond the shadow of a doubt, this is the risen Lord. This is the Son of God. He is worthy of our worship. The church worships Jesus in this moment. And perhaps that's an ordinary thing for us to say as 21st century Christians. With 2,000 years of worshiping the risen Christ, but for the disciples, this is really the first moment where they really understand who this Jesus is. And so it ought to be the same for us that what we meditate on as we think about ascension, as we think about the risen Lord and ascended Lord that we, that we worship. That our response is to fall down on our faces before the risen Lord and worship Him. Our Savior is worthy to be praised. The one who entered into this world, who became a, a man, who suffered and died, who rose again, is worthy of our worship. He's worthy to be praised. If we think about the, the transition in His life from coming into the world as a helpless child to being the Lamb who was slain, He is now in this moment the Lion of the tribe of Judah. The suffering servant of Isaiah 53 has become the, 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 cruci- the Lord of glory, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He enters into the throne room of heaven and he sits down at the Father's right hand and he has, as Matthew tells us in his gospel, all authority in heaven and on earth and under the earth. This is the Lord we worship. But it's more than that. If we think about the joy that fills the disciples, it's not just that they finally know who he is, there's more than that as well. His ascension is a tremendous blessing for the church. We are far better off with Jesus in heaven than we are if he had remained here beside us. You're far better off with Jesus in heaven than with him right beside you. That's why the disciples are filled with joy. And that's the part I want to explore with you uh, this afternoon. It's good for the church that Jesus has ascended into heaven. And it's very clear from what happens in this moment of ascension. This is verse 50. He led them out as far as Bethany, so he goes over the Mount of Olives uh, to the town of Bethany where Lazarus and Mary and Martha lived, and he lifts up his hands and he blesses them. And Luke tells us that it's while he blesses them that he parts from them and goes up into heaven. The last picture the disciples have of Jesus, their beloved rabbi, their beloved savior, the last picture they have in their minds is of him ascending into heaven, blessing them, his hands outstretched in blessing Jesus is their great high priest. He's acting here as the great high priest of the church. We have to think here, and the disciples no doubt would have known it so much better because they were there at the temple when the high priest would do his work. But the high priest would be there in the temple offering up sacrifices on the altar, killing the animals, his hands covered in blood. It would fling that blood on the side of the the altar And before he descended from the altar, he would turn around to the people who were gathered there witnessing this act of sacrifice. And he would stretch out those bloodied hands and he would provide the blessing of the Lord upon them. The high priest would pronounce upon them, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Those were beautiful moments for the people of God. The picture of the sacrifice was a picture of the forgiveness of sins, and the picture of the priest with the outstretched arms was the grace and favor being showered down upon them. But it pales in comparison to what the disciples see in this moment, what we see in the Word of God this morning. You see, the Old Testament priests, you know, were sinners themselves. As they offered these sacrifices, they weren't just offering for the people, they were offering sacrifices for themselves. And none of those sacrifices could actually wash away sins. Their hands got bloody again. And they went back up to that altar for another sacrifice, another sacrifice. And the next day again, day after day after day, the blood was shed. But as Christ ascends before the eyes of his disciples here, his hands are outstretched in blessing and his hands are freed entirely from blood. Because the sacrifice, the one sacrifice that can pay for sins has been offered up at the cross. There's still the proofs of his sacrifice, of course. Those hands that are outstretched in blessing have the nail marks still there. So the disciples know of his sacrifice in that moment, but there's no blood because he's offered up the sacrifice for them. He gives the blessing as the very great high priest, the only one who can pay for the sins of the people. 
We need to see more here, in fact, because the disciples are under the blessing arms of not just a high priest, but the Son of God. The high priest is the Son of God, so whereas the high priests were always representatives of God, here they have God himself stretching out his hands and blessing upon them. It's not just a a, a wish. It's not just a farewell, a sort of, I hope everything goes well with you now, I'm, I'm going away. Strength. As he stretches out his arms, his face is actually turned towards them. And he's looking, he's shining upon them. His grace and his favor are pouring down upon them. And the same is true today. Christ's face is turned towards the church. His hands are uplifted in blessing over the church. That's the beauty of what Luke describes us to us I think this is the most wonderful picture. Verse 51, he says, while he blessed them, he parted from heaven. I wonder if you can visualize. You don't have a mental picture of Jesus. That's fine. You don't need one. But just visualize the ascended Lord with his hands outstretched, ascending into heaven. And the last thing before the clouds take him from view, the last thing they see, he's still got his hands outstretched in blessing over the church. And the the most wonderful reality, we didn't read Acts chapter 1, but Luke tells us there, actually Jesus tells us that he's going to come back in exactly the same way. That is, he's going to come back down with his hands still outstretched in blessing. Why? Because Jesus never stops blessing the church. Because his hands never drop to his side. Because his face is always shining down upon his bride. And here we are reminded that the blessing of Jesus Christ on his church is so essential to us. His blessing over our work, his blessing over the work of the church, his blessing over our weekly worship, his blessing over our small group meetings, over our work of mission, his blessing over everything that we do as the people of God and as the church, we need his blessing upon us. We need those outstretched arms if it is to do any good or be to his glory. That's why the wonderful reality is that every service you come here, you get to go out into the world with the blessing of your risen Lord and Savior. I wonder if you appreciate that blessing that comes at the end of every service, or if it just becomes something like a dismissal of sorts. Okay, we're done. I collect my purse or my Bible or my book of praise. It becomes just this stop sign at the end of the service. The blessing of Christ is communicated to you from this place week in and week out. Some of you are Clarion subscribers. Uh, the latest Clarion I got on Thursday, just as I preached this service in Lincoln on Thursday night on Ascension Day, and uh, I had just read Winston Bosch's um, meditation in, in Clarion, and he expressed how the blessing is his favorite part of the service. It's mine too. It is this moment where as the ambassador of Christ, and perhaps Pastor Tony as well, has this moment, we get to stand here and on behalf of Christ, as the ambassador of Christ, send you out with the blessing of the Lord. That is a wonderful and glorious reality. And sometimes when we do things over and over and over again, we start to lose the flavor and the amazement. Christ blesses you continually. You live under the outstretched arms of Jesus, and that reality is communicated to you each and every Sunday as you go from this place, and you need it. This isn't a blessing like we offer some kind of pious wish or or a hope. Christ turns his face towards you. The picture, this picture of Christ with his arms outstretched over the church, it reminds me of something you may have seen, pictures of, of Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. You know, they have that massive statue on the hillside. Now, we can talk about uh, statues of Christ or whether or not that's permitted. But in any case, they have this massive statue of Christ the Redeemer with his arms outstretched, and it just overshadows the valley down below. It's this striking image. But what I want to do with that image that might be in your minds right now is to say the reality of Christ stretching out his arms over the church is no less real than that statue. In fact, it is more gloriously real. And what's more, his hands don't just stretch out over one particular valley in one particular city. His hands stretch out over the entirety of the the universe. It's wonderful how Luke points out to us in the passage immediately prior that Jesus is Jesus. He has a physical body. 
He eats and drinks with the disciples. He ascends into heaven with a physical body. We have a risen Savior who is there in the very presence of God with a physical body, and he stretches out his physical hands in blessing upon the church. I think there's this beautiful illustration of what that means in the Old Testament. I imagine some of the kids would be familiar with this story as, as well. It's when, the, it's when the Israelites are going from Egypt to the Promised Land, and they have these battles along the way. And the one I'm thinking of in particular is the battle against the Amalekites. The battle up, up against the Amalekites is happening in a valley, and Moses is up on a hillside nearby. And you may be recalling the story now. Moses is up on a hillside nearby, and he has to stretch out his hands. God commands him to stretch out his hands over the Israelites fighting in the valley below. And as long as his hands are outstretched in blessing, the Israelites have the upper hand. They're defeating the Amalekites. But being a, a, a man with weakness, he, his hands drop to his side. And every time his hands fall down, the Amalekites get the upper hand. And so he has to call Aaron and her over and they have to prop up his arms so that his arms never fall down. And so the Israelites get the victory over their enemies. Well, that's a picture of the great high priest, Jesus Christ, who extends his hands in blessing over the church. But Christ's hands never drop. His arms never drop. He never gets tired. He pours out his blessing constantly and consistently upon the church. You say the gates of hell will not prevail against the church because Christ is the King of kings and the Lord of lords and he has all power in heaven and on earth and he's communicating that power to his church. That's the beauty of Christ's constant blessing. And so when we think of the joy that it fills the disciples here, they know they have a great high priest now. He's not going to go into this earthly temple to offer up earthly sacrifices. He's going straight into the very throne room of God. That's where we find our joy as well. Find your joy in the risen and ascended Lord Jesus Christ who is blessing you constantly. Find joy in the reality that you live under his outstretched arms. And then think even more of this, that this, this is the same Jesus, of course, who, who went to the cross in your place. That he bears the marks of the cross on his body to remind us he's the same Savior who loved you to the end. This same Jesus is the Lord of heaven and earth. All authority has been given to your Savior. Let me give a, a really weak comparison. Imagine the, your best friend, the one who you grew up with, the one who was your maid of honor or your best man at your wedding, becomes the most powerful person in the universe the President of the United States or something like that. And you still have this close, intimate relationship. You have that kind of access uh, to power. Well, that's nothing. The Lord Jesus Christ, who, who conquered death and is at the Father's right hand and has all power in heaven, he is the same Jesus who loved you intimately to the end. He's no longer the suffering servant that he was on the cross, but he's the exalted Lord of glory. When he comes to the disciples, I think there's a beautiful illustration of this truth. When he comes to the disciples in verse 38, they think they see a ghost, right? You can't blame them in some respects. Um, verse 38, he says to them, why are you troubled and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Doesn't that sound like the Jesus we know all too well from the Gospels? This Jesus who comes to his disciples who are doubting, who are weak in faith and tenderly addresses their hearts and their souls, he hasn't changed. The same Jesus who, who shows his compassion to his people throughout his life on earth, the same Jesus who went to the cross in your place for the joy that was set before him and endured the cross, despising its shame, this same Jesus is the exalted Lord of heaven and earth. Though he is ascended and glorious, and though angels are casting down their crowns before him, though he dwells in resplendent light, he's your savior. He's your elder brother. He's your friend. He's the one who loves you. He hasn't abandoned you. John's gospel has Jesus say to his disciples, I will not leave you as orphans. Jesus knows how we might feel, and he's left us behind. 
He says, I will not abandon you. And that's the truth that Luke teaches us as well. How is it that Jesus has not abandoned his church? Well, in verse 49, he gives us the glorious truth. He says, behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. You see, we're going to celebrate uh, Pentecost next week, and this is a sneak preview of Pentecost. Jesus was going to pour out the Spirit of God upon the church. You see, while Jesus was bodily present on this earth, he could only be in one place at one time. When he was in Jerusalem, he was in Jerusalem and not in Galilee. When he was in Galilee, he was in Galilee and not in Jerusalem. But by the power of the Spirit, which he's poured out on the church, he is present everywhere. He is present with his church. He is present in this place, in this moment, in a special way. Not just in Jerusalem, not just in, here in southern Ontario, not just in, in Brazil, in Papua New Guinea, in China. He is present with his people. On this special day, as people gather together in his name, he is present with his people. And not just then, but he's present with us as his brothers and sisters, personally. Christ has accomplished everything. He has ascended to the Father's throne and he poured out his spirit on the church that he might bring his presence into our very hearts. He's closer than ever before. He is closer now to us than he was to his disciples as they walked along the roads of Galilee with him. I want you to let that sink in for a moment this morning. And not just this morning, but tomorrow and the next day. To remind yourself day by day that he is closer than you think. He's closer than you would dare to hope. He's right here. He left this earth so that he could be as close as possible to us on this side of his return. He is here with us. You see, so often as we go through the walk of faith, because it's a walk of faith and not by sight, we forget to open our eyes. We forget to remind ourselves of what is true in this world. We, for, we see only what we can see with our physical eyes and we forget the realities of what God is teaching us in his word and telling us in his word, including his constant presence. He is always with us. That's the beautiful promise Jesus gave his disciples in the end of Matthew's gospel. He said, surely I am with you even to the very end of the age. He meant it. He said it even as he was about to ascend into heaven and he meant it. He's poured out his spirit on the church. So don't rely on your experience of his presence. Don't rely on your feelings about his presence. Don't think that if you can't feel his presence, he isn't here. Don't think that because you can't see him with your physical eyes, he's not here. The risen and ascended Savior is closer to you than you could possibly dare to dream. And closer to the disciples than he was when he was with them on the Sea of Galilee. He's there when you're frantically running here, there, and everywhere, trying to get everything done. He's there when it feels like it's so dark there's no light. He's there when you find yourself wrestling with doubts and lack of assurance. He's there all the time. Christ is with his church. Though you don't feel his, re- his reality, it doesn't change a thing. It's true. So tell your soul what's true. Remind your soul what is true, that Christ's ascension was so that he could come and be with his church. It does more than that as well. Luke tells us not only does he send the promise of his father to be with us, but he also says there, stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. The Spirit comes and gives power to the church. The question we can ask is why? What's the purpose of this power that the Spirit gives? And there's something in what Jesus tells his disciples earlier. He describes what happens in the scriptures or what's foretold in the scriptures in verse 46. And he says, he says to his disciples, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. And we might expect, given that he's sort of writing out his path from humiliation to exaltation, that the next step is after the resurrection, the ascension. And then the scriptures say he's going to ascend into heaven, but he doesn't do that. He skips that part. And he jumps right ahead to that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. He jumps right to the church. So what's the purpose? The Son of Man came. It was all predicted in the Old Testament. The Son of Man came, he suffered, he died, he rose again. And now forgiveness of sins and repentance is going to be preached to all the nations 
That's what the power of the Spirit is for. He's going to pour out a spirit on the church so that the church can go out and proclaim the forgiveness of sins and repentance in the name of Jesus. It's to empower the church for its mission to the world. See, the disciples are going to be alone to a degree. And so they need to know that the Spirit of Christ is going to equip them to do the work that he called them to do. They're going to be witnesses from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the ends of the earth, and not just the disciples, but the church. We need the Spirit of Christ to empower us for our mission to the world. You see, Christ's outstretched arms are not just a defense mechanism against the inroads of the evil one or the attacks of the devil. They are a means of blessing the church so that we might go out to seek and save the lost, so that we might go out and proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to those who are in bondage. As Christ ascends into heaven and blesses the church, his church. He doesn't just expect the disciples now to, to go and pull in ranks and wait for him to return. There were those Christians in, in Paul's day as well who anticipated that reality. Just hold on, Christ is coming back. Let's put up our feet and, and wait it out. No, Christ's ascension to heaven, his authority is given to the church so that by the power of his spirit, we might go out. So the blessing hands of Christ are extended through the church as well. As one hymn puts it beautifully, Christ has no hands on earth but yours. That's the reality of what Jesus is communicating here. He's poured out his spirit on the church that we might be the blessing hands of Jesus in our cities, in our communities, in our country, in our world. And so the blessing of Christ flows out through the church as well. Isn't it amazing? The gift of the spirit. We'll celebrate it more next week, Lord willing that Christ has equipped us. He's given us his spirit. He's ascended into heaven so that he might be closer than ever before. What's your response this morning? You think of these glorious realities. What do the disciples do when Jesus is gone? No doubt we know from Acts 1, they, they watched until he disappeared from view. Remember, and the angels said, why are you looking to heaven? Get to, get to work. What do they do? They They worship. We're told that they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. Verse 53, we're continually in the temple blessing God. They are over the moon excited about what has happened before their very eyes. And the only thing they can think of doing in that moment, moment by moment, is to worship the risen Christ. They saw the glory of God in the face of Jesus. And all they can do is worship. I think there's something here. We're, we're gonna wait, they're going to wait 10 days before the Spirit is poured out. Our Pentecost happens 10 days after Ascension. I think there's something here about the fact that for 10 days, Jesus makes them wait, and he wants them to worship. Because the work should always be rooted and grounded in worship. And the work should always flow out of our worship. They need time before they begin the work of ministry, before they begin the work of mission, they need time to worship the risen Christ. Work should always flow out of worship. And we think of our own daily lives as well. How can we expect our daily lives be to the glory of God's name if we don't begin again and again and again with worship? How can we expect to encounter and experience the risen Christ in our daily activities if we haven't begun with worship, if our lives are not marinated in worship? That's why our week begins the way it does. This is the the place where we get equipped. This is the place where we get uh, reoriented, where our desires are reconformed after the desires of God himself. And so we are here to worship so that we might go out and worship Christ tomorrow and the next day and the next day after that. And that's how we sustain our joy, isn't it? And so this joy that we see in the disciples sustains the church today. It's a joy that's rooted in the worship of the risen and ascended Christ. And so if you've lost the joy of daily worship, if your daily life has become a chore, the answer is for you to lift your gaze and to see the risen and ascended Lord. It's to fix your eyes on Jesus again. In his word, here in this place where we gather for worship weekly, it's to go where Christ gathers his church is to go out into the world knowing that you live under the blessing arms of Jesus. So this morning, if you're in need of encouragement and joy and comfort, look up. See the risen 
and ascended Lord with his arms outstretched, the nail marks still imprinted in his hands, the same Savior who left this world, who died on the cross for our sins, is the risen King of kings, 